So tonight is Journey Through the Bible. Uh, it's our summer digs here. We now have a new place that we're going to be giving the Bible study. And it will be in the library. If anybody online wants to come over the next couple weeks, then we're going to have it in the library. And we apologize to anybody that's trying to get here for not making it more uh, obvious. <laughs> so, but let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, Lord, everywhere present, and fill us all things. Treasure your blessings and giver of life. Come and abide in us and dwell in us and save us from every stain. O good one. Amen. <laughs> so tonight we have two parts to this. We're going to be doing our continue our study on chapter 20 in Matthew. We're going to take a deep dive with Dr. Subdeacon Osama Anunu. He's going to be doing all the, the scripture reading for us. And then we're going to take a dive into the saints. We're going to look at two saints. Really, we're going to look at a group of saints, the Cosmos and Damien, which are two physician healing. We're going to be basically talking about the gift of healing that is was given to the church and we're going to talk about how we can actually utilize that in our lives as the members of the church so those are two parts to this evening the first part is going to be the scripture reading and we're going to talk to dr uh, nunu and then i'll take over and do the part about the physicians as saints so we have a Physician Saint with us, so I'm going to turn it over for the physician to take over the Bible study. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, I want to start actually by a question that was raised last time and uh, about the 24 elders in the book of the Re Revelation and what do they represent. Just because to be honest, uh, the book of Revelation is hard and actually the interpretation uh, needs I, uh, the saints to kind of interpret it. It's very uh, deep and quite honestly, no one understands the book of Revelation 100% because there are things that have not taken place and many things will be understood in retrospect, not before the, the actual events. Uh, so according to the Orthodox uh, Study Bible, this is the uh, the of 24 uh, elders are mentioned in the uh, in uh, chapter 4 verse 4 and uh, here they say the 24 elders are usually interpreted to be the elders of the old and new covenants the 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 apostles the fullness in, of both covenants they are the foundation of the people of uh, God in both covenants these elders continually fall down before God in worship, in adoration and praise. So this clear, clears kind of the answer for uh, the last time for the questions. Uh, so now going back to the book of Matthew, we finished chapter 19. We're starting chapter 20. So here's uh, Jesus is talking. Uh, he says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day. He sent them into his vineyard, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and he did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle, meaning they had no work, and said to them, Why have you been standing there idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, you, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will be receive. So when the evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, 
call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those, uh, uh, and when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they were each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landlord, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne and the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Isn't it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last, for many are called but few chosen. So let's explain this story more. Uh, the landlord is God. Okay, the laborers are us. Um, and uh, the dinaris is the uh, salvation or entering the kingdom of God. That's what it does. Uh, so. so just to give you guys a background, the day in the Jewish uh, uh, culture starts at actually 6 a.m. So the first people who were hired started at 6 a.m. So the next, so they started working. It was agreed, denarius start at 6 a.m. So, and then the, the, the Lord went looking for other, uh, he was walking, saw other people not working at, what was the first hour after 6 a.m.? Huh? Uh, he, he said, um, and then he went about the third hour. What's the third hour? Subtract six hours. That's 9 a.m. So 6 a.m., then the third hour is actually 9 a.m. So always subtract six. And then he went out the marketplace, and uh, then, then he went to the sixth hour. Sixth hour would be what? If you subtract uh, six, it will be noon. Yeah. And the ninth hour? Three. Three. And the eleventh hour? 5 p.m. That means the day ends at 6 p.m., which they only work one hour. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. So just to give you an idea, this is how the Jewish day and the book of the hour of prayers is based on the Jewish times. So this is the, these are the hours. When we say, okay, and, and just to give you an idea, the day starts in the Jewish calendar and at sunset. So when we say Jesus died on the uh, 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 he died and he rose again on the third day. How can it be Friday and on Sunday? Sunday is only two days after. But actually, based on the Jewish, the day started actually Thursday night, so Thursday evening. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is three days, actually, because the day started on Thursday evening. Make sense? Mm -hmm. so, so you have to take the culture and the times there in perspective. Now, now let's dig deep more. I'm just giving you just the background, like how, like, uh, uh, what God has done. Uh, what is the point of this? Why? Is it fair that some uh, person worked all day and, and somebody only worked an hour to get paid the same? So let's think about this just for a moment. Um, these people did not have someone to hire him. That's what they told the landlord. They told him, we want to work, but we could not find somebody to hire us. It's not like they don't want to work. It's just no one hired them. So God had mercy on them and told them, go to work. Okay? So, the, uh, so that's one point. The second point is um, uh, uh, the denarius is the only entering the kingdom of God. Every, is everybody equal in the kingdom of God? When we reach the kingdom of God, is every are we like are we gonna be like Saint Saint Mary, reward wise or no? No. 
And how do we know that? We're not equal to, even in hell, no, not everybody's equal. Why? How do we know that? We Actually, if, to interpret the Bible, you need to read, you cannot interpret, you have to take it as a whole. You cannot just take one verse and leave the rest. If you leave, read uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 41, he actually says, that, like, uh, I'm going to read it so that you guys understand. There are levels in, in uh, the dinar is only entering the kingdom of God, but uh, let's go there. 1 Corinthians um, 15, verse uh, 41. So here it says, There is one, uh, one glory of the sun, another glory for the moon, another glory for the star, for one star differs from another in glory. Okay, so the interpretation is some people have more glory than others uh, in heaven. Okay? Uh, but going back, I, now, this, by the way, this parable is packed. Uh, so what does the, the saints interpret people who are in the third, sixth, ninth, and eleven hours as phases? This is one interpretation. I'm going to give you another interpretation. As phases during the Jewish history, like Noah, uh, and then uh, uh, Abraham, and then Moses. And uh, at, that, at that time, these people, uh, and then Jesus, and the Gentiles are the ones who came at the 11th hour. So it's the invitations of different people during uh, Christian, uh, Jewish Christian history. So the Gentiles are the ones who came at the 11th hour. Before that, it was Noah, then Abraham, then Moses, okay? And God gave the Gentiles the same kind of uh, reward, okay? Another interpretation is phases in our lives, our own lives. Um, Sometimes we will not get to know God later to later uh, in our lives. And God says, it's okay. I accept you. So we don't fall into despair like, the, oh, it, I've lived all my life away from God, and now I'm repenting, and I want to uh, commit my life to God. This is still okay. God will receive you. And then uh, Jesus did this when? With the thief on the right. He came to him in his last moment, basically, the final moment, told him, Remember me, O Lord, in your kingdom. So, so God will accept us any time during our lives, whether we go now or later. And here it says the landlord went looking. So he, God seeks after us. God seeks after us. The sinners, we are all sinners, and God seeks after us. And those who accept the invitation get saved, okay? And um, uh, so, so th this is the beauty of, of Christianity and the mercy of God. And how do we, w which parable we can compare this to? This parable, we can compare, you guys know the parable of the prodigal son, right? Those who are waiting, if you, let's say, I want to tell you, like, look at your own life, and I'll, I'll go back to this parable. If you're away from God, do you think you are truly happy? Those who are waiting, like not doing any work, are you truly happy? You don't have peace. When you live with God, there's nothing like it. If I tell you, like, okay, would I rather be like Jeff Bezos having all the money or the glory or like Warren Buffett or Elon Musk or live with God, which is worth for me as a Christian. I'll tell you, being with Christ is the most precious thing. So I should be happy for anyone who receives Christ. Does this make sense? Like we are actually in a big blessing. You have the... God gave you more than all the money can give you, which is what? His Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Many Christians don't understand how this is a big privilege. You have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. 
that's worse than anything, you know. So those who started earlier with God are actually at an advantage. Being with God is worth more than any, you know, anything. And that's the point Christ wanted, wanted to make, you know. Be happy who are being saved. Actually, as Christians, we have to have holy zeal to save the lives of others, to gather. We need more laborers to harvest. Does, does this make sense? We need to pray for people who are away from the church to come to the church. So ask yourself, do I have zeal? Do I pray for people to come to know the God? Or do I, do I talk to them about Christ? Do I act like a true Christian? Or do I stumble people? So, the, the, so this is the whole point here. That And going back to the issue of the prodigal son, you know, the, 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 there was a man, a rich man, who had two children, the older one who stayed with him. The other one t- told him, give me my inheritance. And what did he do? He wasted it all. Right? So this younger kid lived in misery. And that's the condition of those who are away from God, living in sin. And who complained when the young fellow went back to his dad? The older one, he acted exactly like the people who were saying, we worked all day with you. Right? So, in this case, you know, God, uh, they, uh, we should be happy that a sinner comes to God no, at whatever stage they're in their lives. We should, this is, should be, uh, uh, go ahead, do you want to say something? Yeah, yes. even uh, Jesus said, uh, God has a, um, different level. Right. I don't think so. I think this is like something related to this. Or not? Right. I mean, like he, yes, he went to prepare a place for us in for heaven. Us, but it's level, like. There are levels, exactly. Right. Level. Because we're not going to be like St. Saint, Saint Mary or St. Saint, uh, George. who St. George, like just to give you an example, suffered seven years, seven years, terrible suffering and never denied Christ. I mean, the miracle that, he, I mean, his miracle, he still comes and does miracle after his death, you know, like miracles after miracles. Uh, he was called the prince of all martyrs. Mm-hmm. That's how, I mean, we, there's no way we can, you know, reach the, these people's levels. I mean, God honored him. And by the way, there are saints, their life is so hidden, we never heard of them. There are, you know what I'm saying? So... So anyways, going on, this is uh, the point of this parable. And, and that's why another thing we learned from this parable is that we should never judge. You may see a person who's sinning right now. Like, let's say, Mary of Egypt. If you looked at her life, you can say, this lady is going straight to hell. And now, we have a, a Sunday dedicated for her during Lent. You know what I'm saying? That's the, and this lady became first. And that's why we should never judge a person because this person may be ahead of us in the kingdom of God. So God should uh, should only judge, not us. Um, So going on, uh, um, now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, uh, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock him and to scourge him and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. So, why did Jesus tell them that? Anybody has an idea? Why did Jesus prophesy and he told them actually what's going to happen? He told them this so that they don't get surprised, they don't get shocked. They, I mean, they were shocked and everything, but he wanted to prepare them of what's coming. They saw Jesus as someone who is... Uh, 
like do does all these miracles uh feed all the and then he is going to be crucified but he he in this way he's preparing them to what's coming ahead that's that's pretty much it he wants to prepare them so they're not shocked going to verse 20 then the mother of zebedee sons came to him with uh, i'm sorry the 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 mother of zebedee's sons came to him with her sons which are john and james kneeling down and ask asking something from him so the mother with her two sons who are disciples of jesus asked him a favor basically and he said to her what do you do you wish what do you want and she said to him grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and the other on the left in your kingdom but jesus answered and said you do not know what you ask are you able to drink the cup that i am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism i'm uh, i'm baptized with they said to him we are able so here we see that the sons his own disciple agreeing with their mom's request they're agreeing with her they want what she asked for so he said to them you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism i'm baptized with but to sit on my right and on my left is not mine to give but it's for those for whom it's prepared by my father so and then i'm sorry i'm sorry and when the ten heard it they were greatly displeased with the two brothers but jesus called them to himself and said you know the rulers of the gentiles lord uh, lord it over them and those who are great exercise authority over them yet it shall not be so among you but whoever desires to become great among you let him be your servant and whoever desires to be first among you let him be your slave just as the son of man did not come to be served but to serve to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many this is uh this is uh, something uh, uh, very important for us to understand and it's difficult actually um to to apply uh the the mother of these two disciples wanted honor her sons to be honored by sitting on the right and the left of jesus there are still uh having earthly mindedness or they think of jesus of an as an earthly king or they are thinking like he will be have an earthly kingdom you know a lot of the uh, uh, the Jews at that point, because of the Romans' control, wanted the Romans out and they wanted an earthly kingdom on earth. Like they have a Jewish kind of state like we have now. So, um, so Jesus told them, you don't know what you're asking. You don't understand what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the cup, which is the cup meaning his crucifixion, and to drink... And be baptized, which is uh, uh, basically die with the bapt. So it's a it's a baptism of blood that I am baptized, and indeed, uh, uh, and they said yes. And Jesus said, indeed, you will drink the my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. So, how did this happen to these two disciples? St. James, actually, if you read the book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 2, he got actually killed by Herod. He was decapitated. St. John suffered all his life. God allowed him to live. He, he was the only disciple that didn't die, but he suffered basically persecution, which is the cup, the cup of suffering. Uh, but God allowed St. John to live because he fought many heresies in the early church. And he was, we know that he was exiled and uh, he had his vision in the uh, island of Patmos, Patmos in, in, uh, in Greece. So he suffered all his life 
for Christ. And actually, he took care of St. Mary. Remember, Jesus uh, told him, this is your mother, and he told her, this is your son. So, uh, sometimes we ask God for things. Please, God, do this for me, do that for me. And how does God answer prayers? Just in general. God can sometimes say yes. He says no. And he says wait. And sometimes he says if. Yes, meaning yes. You, this is what your heart wants. And I'm going to give it to you. And it's according to my will. No, sometimes we ask for things that are bad for us. Like how many of you who have kids... Your, your son or your daughter will come to you and ask for something and you know it's going to be bad for them and you tell them no and they don't understand. This is the kind of thing they're asking. They're asking for glory. Okay? That's the wrong thing to ask for. Wait. A lot of times God tells us wait because he wants to change us or gives us some, something better than what we asked for. If, if we have a certain sin in our lives that's hindering our relationship with him and he pref and he 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 wants us to cleanse ourselves so here what is jesus teaching here to all of us and to these disciples he's teaching us humility in the world what do people look for what do big countries and they look for two things you guys tell me Money and power, right? And Jesus is telling well, this is we're we're in the world but not of the world. This is not the way we think. If you want to be first, you have to be last. You have to you, instead of being served, you need to serve. And that's what he did. He washed the feet of his disciples. He told them the Son of Man and Jesus, you know, he is a He's a divine figure, came down, took the shape of his creation, and came for us. He came to serve us. He came to die for us. So he actually humbled himself, and he wants us to do the same. Not A lot of us, we like to be the boss. We like to be, but that's not the way, the way Christians should think. We have to kind of... Uh, get that program out of our heads, which is the way culture teaches us to be. And and I think the only way to be able to do that is with the help of the Holy Spirit. Because, and you know, it reminded me of the prayer of St. Aphram, the Syrian, the one we uh, pray during Lent. And I'm going to read it to you guys. And what does he say, which is very cool? Um uh, he says, O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, and he, he was, he says, lust of power. Take away the spirit of lust of power. We lust over power. We want to be number one. And idle talk, then he goes. But anyways, so this is a big test for us to learn humility. Humility is very hard and one of the saints says what is the big big biggest test for humility Pride. that you are truly humble is how you take indignity somebody insults you and how are you able to respond most people will respond back yell back scream and look at Jesus. He was insulted, slapped. He kept his mouth shut. And that, that's hard. I mean, that's, that's hard. You know, that's a, we may view this as weakness, but this is ultimate power. This is what God rewards. That's what God... Because if you think if we are truly humble, what happens to us? God lifts up the humble and resists the proud. So if God is on your side, 
you're the most powerful person of the world. If you are proud, you should be worried and scared. Because who are you to resist the Almighty God, right? Who are you? We're nothing. And that's why the life of St. Mary is very deep. The, our Protestant brothers and sisters say, oh, she didn't say talk, she doesn't talk much, she's not, she doesn't exist. Yeah, like, she, she's very, she doesn't say much on the Bible. But this is because of her deep humility. That's actually the biggest lesson. She, she, was, say, she was never, she never bragged like, oh, I am, God chose me out of, you know, like, I am, like, like and she always kept silent behind the scenes. And that's why God chose that woman, because she, for her deep humility, which is not easy. And, you know, humility is a mother virtue. What does that mean? It has many daughters. If you're humble, what's going to happen? You're going to be thankful. Okay? If you're humble, um, you're going to be happy. Because humble people, they have peace. They are, they are, they have, uh, they have, uh, uh, there is peace. They don't uh, react to this. They don't complain. The proud people, oh, they have a sense of entitlement. So they're never happy. If you are humble, you don't judge others. So there's not much commotion in your heart. So you're at peace. If you're humble, you smile more. If you're arrogant, you can tell an arrogant person sometimes from their facial expressions. How they, you know, move their mouth, their eyes. Humble person, they'll have a smile. Their facial expression will be different. So, I don't know which saint exactly, I don't remember the name, but like, Seeing a humble person is like seeing God, because God came as a human being, you know, and that's the greatness of the, if that's why the, the Bible is very deep. We can kind of walk through this story, and like, if you don't study it or analyze it, you will not get the spiritual, that's a, it's a treasure. So let's move on. Um, 29. Uh, 29. Now, they went out to, uh, of, uh, of Jericho. A great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Then the multitude warned them, that they should be quiet. But they cried out the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, that our eyes be open, or may be open. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. So here we're seeing the two blind men, some of the kind of allegorical uh, interpretation represent those who had faith in Jesus but never saw him. And the people who told them, you know, be quiet, be quiet, are the, the, vo the, the, the older resistance that Christians get throughout history. And... And how the church or the people uh, who are trying to kind of scream louder, kind of to, to kind of counteract those trials or these challenges. And, um, and also this, this is also kind of like the basis of the uh, Jesus prayer. Uh, the Jesus prayer is, is the attitude, actually, when we say Jesus uh, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We, uh, we kind of, we're asking for God's mercy, but to say, you should not just say the prayer without f 
feeling that you you owe God something. Like you should feel that you really are a sinner, and you need God. You should. It's not like just. We should not worship God with our lips. It must come from the heart. Like I mean what I say that God forgive me, I'm a sinner, I need you. And this is what spiritual poverty is, which is humility. And this is tied into this. When we ask for God, we beg him for mercy, we are humbling ourselves, we are being poor in spirit, meaning we need God. We are we are in we feel poor, we need him. And that's what poor in spirit means. Is like I, I, if I'm not self-sufficient, I need my Creator, I need my Heavenly Father, I need His mercy, I need His love, and what happens? God responds. Actually, the prayer of the heart is the one that moves mountains. You have to kind of uh, uh, when when we go with God with a contrite heart. With a cry of the heart, that's when God hears us. When we go with a, a proud attitude, when we're judging our brothers and sisters, he shuts his ears. He doesn't want to hear it. Sometimes God shuts his ears when we have a lot of sin and, proud, and pride in our hearts. So that's why we have to seek humility. And how do we achieve humility? One way is... By praying, asking God. This is when we ask God, please give me a humble, loving heart. It should be part of our prayers. Number two, accepting the trials of life. The trials of life actually are meant to be. Because if we have a very comfortable life all the time, our prayers are going to be weak. It's never going to be, we we're not going to have the depth. People who go through trials pray from their heart. They feel it. They need God. And that's why we, a lot of, you know, uh, the, the trials are needed for our salvation. They are needed. They are, this is what will tailor our lives, uh, that we love God more and we get attached to Him. And also, it gives us the truth about this life. Because this life is fragile. We want this, we want this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this when I retire, I'm going to do this. How do you know? You have no guarantees. How many people we see die suddenly, or die unexpectedly, or die when they're young, or that, you know what I'm saying? It's, it happens all the time. That's why, you know, we all, life is fragile. But at Christian, as Christian, it doesn't matter. We have hope. We have hope that we have inheritance with God. We're going to be with our loved ones. We're going to be with God. And we must live a life of readiness. It doesn't matter. But, but we must live a life of humility. Uh, because, and, uh, and, and truly... Give our hearts to God. God wants our hearts. He doesn't want anything else. He wants your heart. Um, he wants sincere hearts. And the word, I stress on the word sincere. Because this is the difference between someone uh, who comes to church and after they leave church, they're acting the same, nothing, there is no transformed life. And I'm calling myself an Orthodox Christian. That's not what God wants. God wants you a transformed Orthodox Christian. You are, you are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's something changing from year to year. I'm growing spiritually. I'm loving more people. I'm more humble. I care less and less about money. You know, and this is, this is what we ought to be. Now... I will have to tell you this, that I did not talk to Dr. Nunu before about what he was, the content that he was going to talk about. But everything that he talked about is what I'm talking about, too. So it's a double dose, okay? <laughs> so uh, just to let you know that. So today, today we're going to talk about saints. The second part of each of these Bible studies is 
to be able to look at the church and how during church activities, just like Father George said in the very first time, the, the entire Bible is talked about in liturgy and it is talked about. So, but we're going to talk about how the saints are a representation of the word and how they get there. So today what we're going to do uh, is we're going to review two saints that had on um, last Friday, which is July 1st, had their day, which is the brothers of Cosmos and, and Damien, who are the unmercenaries. And we're going to look at them. And one of the things we're going to do today is we talk about all these saints every week, but, you know, we say, oh, and they were martyred, just like we talked about, you know, like the crucifixions of St. George uh, and, the, and the trials. Today what we're going to look at is a group of physicians and we're going to look at them in the light of how they lived their lives that we can live our lives too. That they were examples of us how to live uh, with the Holy Spirit. Now before we get started, these are about physicians. There are actually, we're going to talk about three sets of brothers who had the same name, Cosmos, Cosmos and Damien. It was a popular uh, name to be able to have for twins at the time. And also we're going to talk about St. Palamon, who is also a healer. What we're going to remember is that when all these figures came about, we had the end of the apostolic age, all the apostles had died. At, in the first century. We had gone into the second century and there was huge amount of persecution. The, the Roman Empire was just, I mean, nutsoid about getting rid of these Christians because they were such a threat to their power. And even though they were humble, they couldn't stop it. It was a spread. There was also the worry that these martyrs would end up, you know, toppling not only local, um, but that they would become the dominant force. And what we find out is that two of the brothers, Damien's, one was from Rome, another one was from basically uh, the Arabic area, and they lived in, Ven and uh, they actually went to Rome and later too. And it was during the time of Diocletian, which is at the end of the third century, in the 200s, and all of them end up being executed, these two sets of brothers. They are both called Cosmos and Damien. Now, the important thing to realize is that they were all unmercenaries. Anybody ever hear the word unmercenaries? It is a way of life. It is exactly what uh, Dr. Asuna was saying, is that they asked to be able to, the presence of the Holy Spirit, they were humble, they fasted, they lived their life according to what they knew. Now, one of the things that you have to realize about this time is that the Gospels and the Epistles were already written. They were written in the first and second century and they were already out there. They, the Roman Empire basically was the, today's Twitter and, and, and uh, Facebook and everybody because they suppressed all these. They tried to suppress all the scripture, but they couldn't. It just kept getting out there. And so people had the scriptures to read and they knew how to live the life according to Christ and they knew how to live according to the epistles of Paul how the church was supposed to work. And these people chose a life based upon the scripture and what was out there to live a humble life, an unmercenary life. Now we know mercenary, most common term of it would be mercantile. In other words, a mercenary is somebody who does a service for pay. Okay, that's how they sustain. Physicians today, you know, you go to them, you pay them for a service and you get uh, healing, right? And that's a way to sustain yourself. But these were all physicians that were unmercenary. In other words, 
they only relied on God for everything. They did not accept payment for anything. They prospered. They had power of the Holy Spirit. They did miracles after miracles, but they never took any money for their work. And they did amazing things. The, the two brothers that were in Rome and in, that, and in um, Asia were, they, if you read their lives, we're not going to get into them, they did unbelievable miracles. And when they were tortured, they were healed and immediately it was almost impossible to be able to execute these, these martyrs. Only way they could be executed because they were tortured, they had, they were, their skin was flayed, they had, you know, burnt, they would all heal. Next thing, only way they got rid of them is by taking their heads off. That's the only way. And that scared Diocletian and it scared all these Roman Empire emperors that, that saw this. Palamon was actually the toughest one. You can read his story. We have a weekend for him. And he actually just, he, he went before the king and, and did a healing and healed the king. And the king was so, well, the emperor was so afraid that he said, kill him. But every time they tortured him, he healed, got healed again and he, again. Finally, the only way to get with well, Palamon is to ex, is cut his head off. This, for some reason, at the end, just before the 300s, before the 4th century, there was just this outpouring of Holy Spirit. And what happened in the 4th century? There was a change that all of a sudden after Diocletian came Const Constantine. And what happened? There was so much power of the Holy Spirit present because people were practicing and living the life of the church so fully that it converted and it made a time where the church actually infused the culture. And that's what all these people in the first, second, first, second and third century were worried about. The, cup, the physicians that we know, the unmercenaries of Mesopotamia, which are Cosmos and uh, Damien, lived during this time after Constantine came to power. So of all these unmercenary physicians that were executed, that were tortured, that died, these two did not. They were able to live and do miracle after miracle after miracle all their lives. How did they do that? At the end of their lives, they were buried together. But th that's because they relied on God. And it was interesting reading the scriptures is that this last Sunday, we actually read the key to their glory, to, their, to the Holy Spirit's infusion. They lived a holy life, and the Lord gave them power. If, if we take a look at Matthew again, Matthew 6, 25, I think, which we've been studying. We already read this, so this is a review for everybody. Matthew 6 and 25. It says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor they gather into a barn, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, which of you by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God has so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, 
O ye of little faith. Now, I want you to remember that. O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And that's what these physicians did. They knew they had faith. And that is where the Holy Spirit was able to use them as instruments to be able to do these healings. And it's, it's not lost today. It is the same thing that we, we talk about today. In fact, before they the, were addressed anyone, these cosmos and Damien would say, quote, It is not by our power that we treat you, but by the power of Christ, the true God. Believe in him and be healed. They were just the instrument to allow the Holy Spirit to move through them that God can do the healing. And by that, they gave the example to everyone to be able to come to, to, to God. The healing also does not re mean just physical. This was also spiritual. This was also in repentance. Believe in him. Have faith in him. This, was, it was, this is where their power came from, if you want to call it power. But this was the, the glory of God moving through them. And if you look at it, St. James uh, said in, in, in uh, James chapter 5, verse 14 through 15, it says, Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over the him, anointing him with oil, oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. So, this, so we got back this thing again. This healing is of faith. Now, so that was of the... James, James, who we talked about earlier, that's how the church worked. This is how we established the, the diaconate and stuff. The, the elders became like the diaconate. Call upon the elders of the church. and they. And, but Meyendorf actually had a thing. He, it's not just the deacons. Anybody remember Meyendorf, right? He wrote many books. That, you know, he, He's considered to be a, a very, very important writer for the Orthodox in the, in, the, in, the, in the 20th century. He said that healing is too important of the church to be left to physicians. It should be done by the laity. You should be able to have your gift to be able to heal others, heal yourself, and be able to in the church. It is part of it. In fact, um, well, let's look at 1 Corinthians. We, we already did 1 Corinthians. Let's go back to Corinthians 12. If everybody can skip your Bible all the way there. Let's see. 2 Thessalonians. Let's see. 1 Corinthians. Now, this is the operation of the church. Whenever we look, of course, at Paul, we're looking at the operation of the church. And this is what he, he was basically telling us. Um, chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts. Now, there's a difference between spiritual gifts, I'm sure you've heard this before, than the fruits of the Spirit, the fruits, uh, meekness, humility. These are the fruits. These are how we, we manifest the, a humble heart, but now with this, the gifts of the Holy Spirit given to the church for the operation of the church is what we're talking about in chapter 12. It says, Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that the Gentiles carry away the dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaks by the Spirit of God, called Jesus, accursed, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 
which basically says, and this is also when we talk about Matthew, you can get away with a lot of things, but you can't curse the Holy Spirit. That's sort of like the big no-no. You can't do that because he's everywhere and in all things. O Heavenly King, the Comfort of the Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and fill us all things. That's the Holy Spirit. You curse that, you curse everything in you. You can't do that. He says, there are div diversities in verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God who worketh all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. That means each one of us in the church, we're not, we may not be deacons, we may not be priests, but we have a ministry in the church. And, it is, and, we, and the Holy Spirit gives us the gift, the power to be able to perform it if we have the faith to follow it. If we say, uh, I, don't, I can't do anything in the church. That's not true. That's not having faith. Each and every one of us has a gift. And, it's, and then it says, 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge, to another the same Spirit, through the same Spirit, to another in faith of the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, another prophecy, discerning the spirits, and other different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing each one individually as He wills. So the key here, though, is for the body is one and has many members, verse 12, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So we are all one body of Christ and we work for the benefit of each other. We don't work for ourselves. We don't ask for these gifts for, like we were talking about, like our kids. Can I have this gift? Oh, can I have this? No, it's we, we ask and we pray. We are humble. Christ tells us that we need to fast. We need to be able to pray. We need to be able to, you know, give our gift. That is a, there's a common thread from the Old Testament into the New Testament every time God talks to us. He says, I'm going to give you everything you need and then you give it to others. You know, Abraham, he says, rely on me, stay in, I'm going to give you the land, it, I'm going to make everything good for you. And Abraham had a few, had a few doubts. And he, God says, you know, you can't really receive the full gift of God if you don't have it. Now, Isaac, he did everything right, and he had a great life. Jacob made a few mistakes, and they had a lot of problems, you know. So, and it kind of goes on and on and on and on. When we don't fully trust God, we end up having problems. If we truly are unmercenary about what we ask from God, God will give us the ability to do what is, has to happen. The providence of God says that we'll probably suffer. We'll probably be crucified for if we're truly doing what God says because that's actually the, the struggle in the world. And the world resists God. But He will always provide for us like the lilies in the field. He will always be there. There is there's a picture of the unmercenaries on the back. And there are a few things I'd like to be able to talk about with this. Is that is that they have each one of them has a, a little like spoon, and this is for the herbs and spices that they would use and to be able to give to the patient. May we say it also, and so this doesn't mean in all these physicians they used the Eastern medicine at the time. They did everything they could, but the healing came at the point of laying on our hands and anointing of oil. But they also would do everything else. And God would be able to provide it for them. So this is actually a really good... Uh, this is, this is a uh, Cosmos and Damien 
of Mesopotamia. There are other ones to look at too. You got a question? Yeah, and I heard uh, when I read about them, before they do anything, they heal in the name of Jesus Christ. That's right. the first thing they ask him to do? Yes. They heal in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they start the treatment with the herbs and other things. They do. That's why it says, it's not by our own power that we treat you, but by the power of Christ, the true God. Believe in him and be healed. Mm -hmm. they, they, and, they, and they were constantly in prayer. As part of that, if you read uh, St. Palamos, it's that unending prayer. They're always in the presence of God. They're always praying. They're always fasting. They're always, um, if, but to kind of wrap this up nicely is that we had talked about how these saints are always part. Of, we always talk about the power, how they actually work in our liturgy. And we actually do have uh, prayers in our liturgy about Cosmos and of Damien. And it's, it, it actually is a beautiful prayer. Um, the hospital, uh, the church actually is the spiritual hospital for the faithful. So, and Jesus uh, healed uh, holistically. When they lowered a paralytic person f uh, from the roof, before he actually healed them, he said, your sins are forgiven. So spiritual healing must precede as the physical healing. And, and, and because there's no point, uh, if this person gets healed, we know he's going to get sick and die again at some point. Yes. But God, or Jesus, wants spiritual healing because he wants to grant them eternal life. That's why he also focused on the uh, spiritual healing. And, uh, and th that's the beauty of it because it's holistic. And uh, unfortunately, these days, uh, the church relied on modern medicine. And uh, even modern medicine, there is a study. Uh, uh, and this is actually uh, published in one of the most famous journals, where actually they, uh, they had a, a two groups of patients in the ICU. One they prayed for, and one a control where they didn't pray. The ones they prayed for uh, actually had better outcome than the ones. Uh, mm -hmm. that, yeah. Nice. Oh, that's that, so, it's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. It's absolutely true. Yeah. There's there's a lot of studies that go that go that way. So the question, there's two questions before I read this this last part that everybody has is okay. Well, all right. So there were healers back in the day, and why don't we have them today? Why is the church don't have healers today? I think we do. I think we do. I think it's. I think it's. We. We should. It's the church. We do have healers. Yeah. I mean, the healers are the doctors. When you have somebody that's not expected to live, and they recover for no reason whatsoever, but they recover, and that is. A healer, that's a miracle. It is. And it still, it still happens today. It does happen with prayer. We, I mean, we, we say prayers every Sunday for liturgy about for the sick. Yes. You know, and there is recovery. There is healing, and there's also ministries of healing. There's there's all these ministries through faith, and every time we visit somebody who's sick and we pray over them, mm -hmm. or in their ICU and we pray over them, there is healing. Yes, and the first things to heal is the body and blood. We do that every Sunday. Yes. If we believe in that, this is it. Give us the power to stay and heal, protect from whatever around us. It doesn't matter from s sickness, from uh, anything around us. It, it's this is the most important part. It is the most important part, is to be able to start with the body and blood, the yes. communion. Yes. And that is the, that's the healing, to be able to be, have remission of sins. Yes. It, it, and then everything flows from that. It, it, absolutely right. So I'm going to, St. Christosom actually had a, he said that, he had a quote in one of his homilies. And if you ever read them, they're like, 
he was definitely called the golden mouth because he is just like powerful yeah. but he he talked about the gifts and he says the gifts do not seem to appear at oftentimes and times when no tribulation is because faith is the most important gift to practice and becomes easier to believe when miracles and healing abound your faith when when there's you know when there's not a need to heal somebody that is ill if but have faith that's the healing right then and there you have faith in god be presence god have the glory of god within you there's a healing that is not necessarily evident like you said but it starts with communion the last the last two quotes i'm going to talk about is in our liturgy and in our liturgy we we have a prayer that starts um, from the Antonat of the Feast of Matins. It's a matin prayer. And it says, it talks about both the, uh, Cosmos and Damien. You draw the unending supply of healing from on high and pour out cures on all the faithful, O oh, unmercenaries. Inevitable, you perform mystical surgeries on your patients and heal them, prescribing for the sick the saving medicines from the spiritual treasure. Since you have become a holy temple of the Trinity, the principle of life, which clearly made us dwelling in you, pray to the Holy Trinity and save our souls. And there's a second one. This is from the Doxican service of the Holy Unction, which is anybody ever gone, it's the most power, to me it's incredibly powerful to go to Holy Unction. It says, since you have the fountain of healing, O holy unmissionaries, you dispense cures to all the need. For you have been granted the very great gift from the ever-flowing wellspring of Christ our Savior. The Lord says to you who emulate the zeal of the apostles, Behold, I have given you authority over unclean spirits, so that you might drive them out and cure every disease and illness. Having truly lived according to his commandments, freely you receive and therefore freely you give, healing the ailments of our souls and our bodies. Amen. Amen. And that's how we should live. And that's a very powerful heal. Any questions on the holy unmercenaries? Anybody online? It's beautiful. Well, I think we're, what time is it? Uh, it's ten. Do we have time? Yeah, we still have time. Yay! Until uh, five minutes, maybe. Well, for five minutes? <laughs> what? Any, like, do you have anything to say, doctor, since this is the guy that does it all the time? Um, there are things that, I mean, uh, like in modern, I mean, modern medicine, a lot of times we can predict if, uh, if a patient, uh, you know, will make it or not. I mean, I had a recent, actually, incident, uh, uh, and I wrote about it in, in social media, is, uh, there is a lady, and I, uh, which I expected to, to die. You know, I mean, she, she was so sick in the ICU. Uh, the ventilator settings were very high, which is, and she's requiring like uh, a lot of medications to keep her alive. And uh, uh, she miraculously recovered, <clears throat> and uh, she went to the long-term. Uh, acute rehab uh, and I saw her there also and I told her I just can't believe you're alive because I thought you're not gonna make it she was uh, in her like uh, late 50s early 60s and uh, she she goes uh, do you believe in guardian angels and I said yes uh, and she said uh, while I was in the ICU there was uh, a lady uh, pushing me back to my body uh, she was wearing a veil and I told her what color is the veil, and she goes blue. Wow. So I showed her a picture of Saint Mary, and said that's her. Wow. So I said, "Wow!" I mean, I was I was shocked. It was kind of like uh, so, you know. Uh, I'm not sure if she. I didn't go further with her, but it just uh, shows you that God does miracles. Uh, why to some people? Why not? It's it's in His great wisdom why this is happening and i think it's uh, ultimately the 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 salvation of souls is his goal like sometimes um uh, uh illness can be a cross 
that people carry but it's meant to also uh, to cleanse the people from many sins because god all, uh, knows ultimately our souls are more important than the body the body is gonna die one day so if a, if an illness will cause a person to repent and uh, and to uh, uh, God may allow it. It's not God will test us with evil, but God, we we follow natural laws, and being in the body, and sometimes God may allow a person, even like Saint Paetheos. I mean, he died of cancer. You know, it's not like or Saint Paul had had a a thorn, and and what is the thorn? It could be a real thorn. We no one knows, or a weakness in his vision. No one knew exactly. But he was struggling with something just to keep him humble. St. Paul who went to the third heavens. So these things will cause him to be proud, but God caused these. So sometimes it's we need the crosses, uh, but also uh, uh, it's, I think God's ultimate goal is for uh, for healing our souls, and He is happy also to help heal our bodies. Um, but some miracles are mind-boggling. Like if you read uh, John chapter nine, when God healed the guy uh, born blind. I mean, this guy was born with a structural structure, like a like almost his eyes were not formed. And Jesus created eyes for these this man. Like he actually made clay, and he created eyes for this guy. I mean that miracle is mind boggling because, uh, and this man, although he was blind, actually was spiritually enlightened, as opposed to the Pharisees, who were who cared more that he was healed on a s- Saturday or Sunday. Sunday yeah, yeah. So. So, but he actually defended Jesus. He said, "Of course, a person who can do this is from God, and you guys are just concerned about nonsense." So, so uh, I don't know. It's uh, healing. The ch- the church is the spiritual hospital, and sometimes we judge. We go to church. We say, "This person is." Uh, is uh is not good how can they be in church they curse they do but the church is meant to be for sinners we are all sick and we go to church so the church is our the place for all of us so and jesus sat with sinners and they said how can this guy sit with sinners how can he be holy and sit with sinners and and that's 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 why the church is for all of us we are all sinners we go to be healed, and the healing is through confession, and uh, and uh, and partaking of the body and, and body of Christ. Confession is very important. I know a lot of people are shy to go and confess their sins to a priest. I I, conf- I go t- to the monastery. I have a father. Like I've been going there for years, and I feel very very relieved. And a lot of the advice. My father of confessions give me is are were very very precious. He's right on. The Holy Spirit speaks through him, and exactly with experience, with the power of the Holy, can diagnose my spiritual ailment and give me the right advice. So it's a great, great. The sacraments are are are, are our spiritual. You know, uh, it's for our spiritual healing. So uh, that's all I need to say. Any other, any other questions right now online? You're quiet today, but you know, can, I, I guess what we'll end with right now is an, an, an understanding that November 1st will be the celebration of, the, of Cosmos and Damien from Mesopotamia. With, they're, they're basically from the Antiochian church. They're actually the, the Arabic uh, brothers that had this title and lived an unmercenary life. So what we'll do in this Bible study is we'll bring them up again on November 1st. The one that was always on on, uh, July 1st was the mercenaries from Rome 
and they end up being they ended up doing ama amazing work in even with animals and healing both all creatures of god's creatures but they definitely they were the first they were in the 200 they are on J july 1st we will celebrate again on november 1st i'll bring it up and we'll and bring some more and why don't we all look see if we see the miracles of life of healing that we see day to day people that come back and how the church actually blesses us and i know i i pay more attention during uh, the liturgy of all the people who are sick that we bring up and pray for them because i know that is the power of the church to heal both body mind and spirit so i guess we can say a prayer to close would you like to say a prayer sure. deacon in the name of father son and holy spirit one god amen lord we thank you for this meeting we ask you O oh lord uh, to bless us in every way to forgive us our sins and transgressions we thank you uh, for this bible study that we may to come to know you more understand your word we ask you to to bless everyone who's present and whoever who could not make it to bless their families heal the sick O oh lord heal us spiritually and physically um, help the poor help the hungry the needy and the sick in every way bless the united states and all the countries in the world and put peace O oh lord we pray for our church for our for Father George, Father Jim, and all the clergy and the people. And we pray, uh, uh, as you taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as a give us is there. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us. Kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, Amen. Amen.